the house as James and his parents got ready to go out for the evening. James was really looking forward to going to the cinema with his friends. His phone was constantly beeping with texts from his mates. His mum and dad had agreed to drop him off on their way to dinner. It was a big night for them, their 20th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Suddenly the phone rang. James overheard his mum speaking to her sister Fiona. It was obvious something was badly wrong. He heard his mum's voice say, Well, we can't go. We've booked a table for dinner. James will just have to do it. Whatever it is, I can't, he said, as his mother came into the living room. Look, James, we need your help. Your Aunt Fiona's house is flooded, and she needs to stay and clear up the damage. She was supposed to be staying over with Nan tonight. I can't go, so there's no other option. But, Mum, I've made plans. I can't do it. My mates will go mad. I could just hear them laughing at me babysitting a 90-year-old. She's do lally. James, that is no way to speak about your great granny. She's marvellous for her age. We can't leave her on her own on a night like this. Anything could happen to her. You can take your laptop and keep in touch with your friends while you're there. James saw he was fighting a losing battle. He knew there was a rota for staying over with his nan at night, ever since she'd had a minor stroke. She wasn't a bad old woman, even if she always rambled on with her stories. He could almost hear the others laughing at him. There wasn't even a decent mobile signal at her place. He was really angry as he grabbed his laptop and stuffed it into his backpack before jumping into the back seat, headphones over his ears. The storm was raging outside. struggled to keep the car on the road. They had to head out towards the coast and the rain lashed down as they reached the end of Nan's lane. His dad stopped the car and James had to make his way by foot down the mucky path. The rain was coming at him sideways and the trees seemed to be nodding like old men's heads. He heard music blaring out. Typical. Not only do lally, but deaf as a post.
let himself in with a key and saw his nan sitting by a blazing log fire. At least it was warm inside. She rose from her armchair to greet him. Ach, it's you, Jimmy. I've been waiting for you. I'll just put the kettle on. She was the only person who called him Jimmy. No point in even trying to correct her. Nan had never lost her accent, even after all these years living away from Ireland. He gave her a hug, and she went off to get him a cup of tea. When she reached the kitchen, James switched channels on the radio to his favourite dance music. He plugged in his laptop to charge it up. Nan brought in the tea, and without saying a word, she switched stations on the radio. Just as they started to drink the tea, the power went off. The room was plunged into darkness, apart from the glow of the fire. Oh no, what are we going to do now? James was worried about charging the computer. Ah well, said Nan, lighting an old oil lamp. Sure, this is what it was like long ago when I was at home in Ireland. We used to sit around the fire telling stories. Stories? What sort of stories? Oh, you know, ghost stories and tales of the Banshee. What's a Banshee? Did nobody ever tell you about the Banshee? Aye, well, she's a fairy woman, and if you were to hear her call, you'd know somebody was not long for this world. What do you mean, Nan? She was talking nonsense as usual. Well, son, some people call her the messenger of death. Whenever anybody hears her cry, someone they care about is going to die. People say she sits combing her long white hair and wailing. I'll tell you a story about it that my granny told me when I was your age. James thought, here we go, another boring story. Long ago in Ireland, there lived a young girl called Bridie. They said she was a lovely looking girl with long black hair and shining blue eyes, blue as cornflowers. She was engaged to a fisherman who was away at sea for weeks at a time. Whenever he was ashore, they would meet up. I expect you'd call it dating, but we'd just say they went walking out together.
Bridie loved to go dancing at the crossroads with all the other young people. And her Sean was as fine a dancer as anybody had ever seen. With his red hair and green eyes, he was really good looking. And they made a handsome couple. They would dance jigs and reels and only had eyes for each other. <laughs> Sean asked Bridie's father for her hand in marriage, and the wedding was arranged. But with just a few weeks to go before the big day, everything changed. Bridie was coming home from getting measured for her wedding dress. It was a night like this. The rain came on and the wind was blowing a gale. Sudden she heard it, a high-pitched wailing sound. She thought her imagination was playing tricks. She could have sworn she saw a wee white woman perched on a big tree along the roadside. The sound got louder. Bridie was heart scared. She took to her heels and ran as fast as she could, but as she did so, it was as if the white woman was hopping from tree to tree along the road. Bridie was hysterical by the time she reached home. She just kept sobbing Sean's name over and over. Sean, Sean. She knew what she'd seen and heard. It was a banshee, all right. Ah, oh, Nan, you're only making that up. Wait till you hear the end of the story. We'll see if you believe me. Bridie knew Sean was away at sea and there was no way to contact him. It wasn't like you young folks nowadays with all your phones. She waited and waited for news and sure enough, word came that Sean's ship had gone down with all hands. The girl nearly died of grief. They finally found his body along the coast and buried him up there with his own people. Bridie never danced again. Well, except for just the one night. What happened, Nan? The next summer, when the Crossroads dances started again, Bridie felt irresistibly drawn to go back to the place where she and Sean had been so happy. <laughs> Bridie had tears rolling down her face as she watched the others dancing from the shelter of the hedge. Bridie stayed on until all the other couples left, but as she made her way back, she heard a soft voice call her name. She'd know that voice anywhere. A tall figure stood beside her. Sean, they told me you were dead, but you're here. We'll never be parted again. turned from her without a word and started to mount a big black horse. 
Wait! Don't go! Take me with you! Her voice was desperate. He reached down and pulled her up behind him and spurred on the horse. Bridie had no idea where they were going. She only knew she was with Sean and that was enough for her. The horse began to gallop like the wind through the dark night. Her shawl blew up round her face. She clutched onto Sean for fear of falling off. A sudden chill went through her as his shirt was soaking wet. She hadn't time to think how that could be for the horse slowed to a trot. In the first flicker of daylight, she saw they'd turned into a churchyard. Now they moved amongst rows of gravestones. The horse stopped and Sean leapt down. As she waited for him to help her dismount, she turned and saw to her horror that instead of a smiling face, she was looking at a snarling skull. A bony hand reached and grasped hold of her shawl. No! Bridie screamed as she pulled away and jumped on the horse, running for her life through the graveyard. She could sense the spectre following right behind her. Just as she reached the stone wall, she heard... Terrified as she was, Bridie turned her head to see the ghost disappear in a swirl of morning mist. They found Bridie lying where she had fainted. Of course, at first nobody believed her story, but then they found the shawl. The shawl, ma'am? The man who looked after the graveyard found Bridie's shawl. They tried to lift it, but it seemed to be stuck under a gravestone. The minister said they could dig down to release it. And sure didn't they find the end of it was caught inside the coffin. It was Sean's coffin right enough. Bridie never went back near that village again. They say she went off to stay with her sister up in Dublin. Well, that's how my granny told it to me. James didn't know what to say. He was used to Nan and her far-fetched stories, but honestly, ghosts and banshees. But surely, Nan, you don't believe in all that rubbish. Maybe I didn't when Granny told me that story, but I did after I heard the banshee. You're not serious. Aye, son. I heard it myself. Not once, but twice. Do you remember your Papa Frank? Nana, do. I was about ten when he died. I remember he used to play the fiddle. He loved the old Irish tunes. Frank was a fine man, and he loved his music. It was his way of remembering where we came from. I'll never forget the night I was coming home from visiting him in the hospital, that last time. He told me to go on home and not be worrying about him, but I knew I should have stayed. I was just coming down the lane after the taxi dropped me off, and I heard it. Just like I told you, a high-pitched wailing sound. Some folk would tell you it's like a cat, or a fox, or even a baby crying. But it didn't sound like anything earthly to me. The phone was ringing as I opened the door, and it was the hospital to tell me Frank had slipped away. That's how it happened, right enough. In the lamplight, James saw her nan just sat still, staring into the fire. Nobody had ever told him that story. He knew Papa Frank had died of a heart attack, but his parents had never told him anything about a banshee. Maybe Nan was really losing it, but she seemed clear enough. Nan, you said you'd heard the banshee twice. When was the other time? Without a word, his nan walked over to the dresser and opened a drawer. When she came back, she had a small silver picture frame in her hand. James peered at it. He was looking at an old photograph of a young man in uniform. Crouching beside the lamp, he wondered if his eyes were playing tricks on him. 
the figure in the frame looked very like him. Who is this man? Is he a relative of yours? His nan took the frame from him and started to speak in a soft, gentle voice. That was my Jimmy. I think it's time I told you about him. Who is he? Did you have a brother you never told me about? His nan gave a chuckle. No, son, he was no brother. He was from America, an airman. You probably know that your Papa Frank and I grew up in a small village in Ireland, near the shores of Loch Ney. Frank was a neighbor and used to lend a hand on my father's farm. He was a great worker, and he'd come in for a keil on Saturday nights. All the neighbors would gather for a friendly chat and to play a few tunes. In the summer, we'd have barn dances. I loved to dance in those days, and I suppose Frank always had a notion of me, as we used to say. Then the war started, and a lot of the boys joined up. Frank was working as an air raid warden in Belfast when the Yanks arrived. That's what the locals called the American servicemen. I was at a dance in the village the first time I saw Jimmy. We'd been well warned about these Americans coming over giving girls chewing gum and nylons. Nylons? Sure, we used to draw lines down the backs of our legs with a pencil, as we never had nylons. They said you had to watch them. Only after one thing, they said. James was starting to get embarrassed hearing his nan talk like this. Anyway, I never found the Yanks to be anything other than well-mannered. They could teach our country boys a thing or two. Great dancers. And I'll never forget going round the floor to that lovely music. Glenn Miller and all the rest. Jimmy was from California, and he told me all about the sunshine there and picking oranges from the trees. It was far from oranges we were reared. Anyway, my friend Betty and I used to chum about together, and Jimmy and his friend Dave would ask us up to dance. Dave had a wee car. We would go for drives. They could get petrol or gas, as they called it, when the locals couldn't. Sometimes there'd be fights. My mother and father weren't too happy with us keeping company with Yanks, but Betty and I didn't care what anybody said. We were in love. Things were getting serious, and there was talk about what would happen when the war was over. Dave and Jimmy talked about taking me and Betty to live in the States. I dreaded to think what my parents would have to say about that, so we kept that part secret. I was giving poor Frank the cold shoulder, but I was young and carefree, hardly more than a couple of years older than you are now. His nan stopped talking and seemed to hold the picture frame closer as she went on. We knew there was a big push coming and that the Americans would be shipping out for Europe. I thought my heart would break the night Jimmy came to say goodbye. That's when he gave me this picture. He promised me he'd come back and I never doubted it for a minute. After he left, I used to go walking by the Loch Shore. I'd often imagine I could hear the dance music playing across the water from the camp. It was a terrible time. 
Frank would come to the farm telling us about air raids in Belfast. And all I had was the odd letter from Jimmy. But sure, the censors had cut the letters to bits, so I'd no idea where he was. Then all of a sudden, the letters stopped. One night, just about this time of year, I went out for a walk along the loch shore, and that's when I first heard it, as plain as plain. That eerie wailing sound that seemed to carry over the water. I remembered what my granny had said. It was like no human sound. I think in my heart I knew from that minute that Jimmy was never coming back. I fainted clean away, just like poor Bridie in my granny's story. The next thing I knew, I woke up in our front room. Frank had found me and carried me home. I just couldn't stop crying, and I could see that they were all worried sick about me. And still no word from Jimmy. <laughs> About three weeks after this, I was sitting outside when I heard the car coming up the lane. When it stopped, I saw Dave and Betty getting out. One look at their faces told me all I needed to know. I went to pieces. Dave told me Jimmy had been shot down over France. No chance of him surviving. He gave me one last letter. He said Jimmy had asked him to deliver it if anything happened to him. I thought my heart would break when I saw his familiar handwriting. I kept in touch with Betty. She moved out to Chicago with Dave, but I was left here to face the music alone. His nan sat still, and James went over and looked at the picture of the handsome, dark-haired man 
who looked strangely like himself. His nan cleared her throat and went on. Hmm. Well, you've maybe guessed the rest by now. I found myself in the family way and didn't know which way to turn. No, Jimmy, a baby on its way. It would have brought shame to my family. James nearly choked. You were pregnant. We didn't call it that in those days. Things were very different then. Yes, I was expecting. And then Frank stepped in, like a knight in shining armor. I think he'd guessed it from the day he carried me home. He'd got himself a job across the water, and he proposed to me. He said we could both make a new start, and sure nobody would be any the wiser who the baby's father was. So that's how we ended up here. I told you he was a fine man, a great father. He loved your Granny Frances as if she was his own. But even though I grew to love Frank, I've never forgotten Jimmy. James was completely gobsmacked. He wondered who knew the story. His mum and Auntie Fiona, even Granny Frances. The old lady stood up and was reaching for her coat. What are you doing, Nan? We can't go out at this time of night. I want to go for a walk by the sea. The storm has died down. I love the sea. It reminds me of the loch at home. Take my arm, son. We'll just go out for a wee while. James pulled up his hoodie and held his Nan's arm. His mother would kill him if she heard about this, but what could he do? The old lady seemed determined. Sure enough, the wind had died down to a gentle breeze. A big full moon had come out from behind the clouds as they took the path from the back of the cottage down to the shore. As they heard the sea swishing in and out over the shingle, his nan stopped still, and it was as if she was listening, straining to hear some long forgotten tune. And that was when he heard it. A plaintive wailing on the wind. James thought it was his imagination playing tricks. He heard it again. And then a third time. It was as if someone had cut the air with a knife. All was dead calm after that. He shivered and took his nan by the arm. Come on, it's time we were getting back to the house. Gently, he led the old lady back to her home and saw her into her room. Just then, the lights snapped back on and his computer chirped into life with messages coming through. Tempted as he was to look at them, he turned to go into the spare room. They'd keep. His mind was still back on the beach, listening to that eerie sound. Next morning, he awoke to the sound of birds.
then the phone rang. James wasn't surprised to hear his mother's voice asking how the evening had gone. He couldn't begin to tell her. That too would have to keep. He gently opened the door of his nan's room and saw her lying peacefully under the patchwork quilt that was her pride and joy. Clutched in her hand was the picture in the silver frame, the photograph of her lost love. A flimsy piece of lined paper was lying on the floor by the bed. He picked it up and started to read. My darling Nora, if you're reading this, you know I won't be coming back to you in this life. I'm writing this on the night we said goodbye, and I've asked Betty to deliver it if anything was to happen to me. My time with you has been more special than I can ever tell you. Sitting here tonight, I can picture your face in front of me, see your blue eyes shining with tears, and hear your soft voice as you bid me farewell. Whatever life offers you, Never forget my feelings for you were deep and true, as I believe in my heart that yours were for me. Grasp every chance you have for happiness. You deserve a rich and full life. With all my love, Jimmy. <laughs>